So here we are in another weekend of snow. Yeah, isn't that great? I love that. Um, I, I, seriously, I don't know about you, but I need springtime and I need it bad. <clears throat> and thankfully, so thankfully, Major League Baseball is here to help us out, right? Yay, because spring training began this week, finally. Um, Pitchers and catchers reported on Wednesday, and full squad workouts for the Royals start tomorrow. Then spring training games begin this Saturday, and, you know, even though those games will not count at all, I will be happy for every victory, whatever we can get, you know. It's great to see them win, even if it's in Arizona. That's fine. <laughs> but the point of spring training, actually, isn't to win. Right? I mean, the point is to get ready to win. And to do that, sometimes you have to make it through some rough innings in the moment as you get your team ready for 162 games that do count, leading, you hope, to baseball heaven, the postseason, right? So for each of us in our own lives, what part of the season are we playing in? This will make better sense as I go on, I promise. I, I think many of us live day to day as if we were always in the late innings of the seventh game of the World Series, you know, as if every move might make the difference between championship or failure. I, I do that, at least. I get frustrated when I can't, you know, get just that much more done in a given week or when I miss something I should have gotten right or when my effort just isn't where I would hope it would be. You know, it, it seems like I'm always in the late innings, and if I let up, the other team's going to win. Now, because of the pastoral nature of baseball, I like to think that Jesus is a fan. I mean, much as I enjoy watching the Chiefs, and especially this season, that was fun, I do have to say I think there may be a little more divinity in coming in safe at home rather than in blitzes and sacks and long bombs and things like that. <laughs> so if Jesus is a baseball fan, I, I think he might point out that when I live this life as if the series were on the line every day, I am missing the elegant beauty of what comes first, which is spring training. Because I think Jesus might argue that spring training is exactly where we are in this life. All of us. Because like spring training, you know, the point of our earthly life, oddly enough, isn't winning today's or tomorrow's game. The point is preparation. The point is practicing the fundamentals. Because you and I are just getting started as we play through a season longer than we can imagine. Life in the here and now, Jesus might say, is really just a warm-up for what's coming. So go back to that uh, reading from 1 Corinthians. <clears throat> now this is not exactly the Apostle Paul's best prose, I would say. I kind of think he needed some editing of the redundancies in that paragraph, but still. Anyway, the repetition ensures... <clears throat> that we don't miss his point, which is that the resurrection of the dead is the good news on which Christian faith rests. If, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, we certainly won't be, and, and this heaven stuff is just a pipe dream after all. But, Paul makes it clear, Jesus was raised from the dead, the first fruits of God's offering of eternal life to everybody who follows Jesus' way of love. So if eternal life is real and actually eternal, that means that in the here and now, we're just getting started on a life of love that has no end. We are just beginning to learn how to play this elegantly beautiful game. You know, just as the pitchers and catchers are loosening stiff joints and remembering their signs and just as the full squad tomorrow will start scooping up grounders and putting bats to balls, so each of us is at the very beginning of a very long haul. 
But still, like I said, we, we kind of have trouble remembering where we stand in this long season of eternal life. Many of us wake up and charge into each day, imagining the championship is on the line. Others of us maybe, you know, find the long season something of a bore. And uh, we want to fast forward to the joy and excitement of the postseason without putting in the work that it takes to get there. And that, strangely enough, brings us to today's gospel reading. Hang on, I promise this will make some sense. This, this is a fairly familiar reading, I think, Luke's version of the Beatitudes. And honestly, I think it's a little hard to hear. At least it is for me. Now, Matthew's version of the Beatitudes is a little less intense. In Matthew, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Okay, I, I kind of think I can get Matthew's version. Pious people are blessed and the rest of us have some work to do. End of sermon, you know. But Luke, eh, that's not Luke. Luke is a little more in your face in the contrast that Jesus draws between the life of worldly success and the life of God's reign and rule of love. Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who are hungry now. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you and exclude you. Rejoice and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. Okay. I mean, just that is hard enough to wrap our heads and hearts around. But then comes the gut punch. Woe to you who are rich, Jesus says, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. <laughs> so it's tempting to twist ourselves up in some real scriptural gymnastics to try to explain that one away, right? But let's be real. Aspiring to be rich, to be well-fed, to enjoy life, to be well regarded by our peers. I mean, kind of sounds like the American dream, right? Who wants to be poor and hungry and weeping and reviled? Well, as we pursue the good life, I think Jesus is asking us to look hard at what the good life really is. It's not about working like demons for our own affluence and satisfaction and status, especially in this microscopic chapter of eternal life. Instead, look back at that reading. It's interesting to see what Jesus offers to those who choose to follow him, those whom he calls blessed or happy in their poverty and hunger and weeping and exclusion <clears throat> Look back at what happened in that reading just before Jesus speaks those hard words. It says, A great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people who'd learned about Jesus came to hear him <clears throat> and be healed of their diseases. And power came out from him and healed all of them. And they, they may be poor and hungry and weeping and excluded, but... They're also healed on every level you can imagine. It is interesting to me that the word salvation looks an awful lot like the word salve, as in an ointment that we apply to heal a wound. Christ's healing is what saves us for this long season of eternal life. And to find that healing, to find that salvation, I think Jesus is calling us in the here and now to focus on the proper work of spring training, which is the fundamentals. As, as that great, great uh, baseball movie Bull Durham puts it, this, this game is pretty simple, really. You throw the ball, you hit the ball, you catch the ball. You know, all the excitement, the 
the double plays and the home runs and the plays at the plate, all the beauty and the championships come from getting the fundamentals right. And I believe the same is true about eternal life. It's, it's practicing the fundamentals that makes us part of the kingdom of God. Because that game, too, is pretty simple. You love God. You love neighbor. You love one another. You choose the path of sacrifice when the world says, take what you can get. You limit the time you spend on what you could have and help someone else get more. You give money even though you can't be sure of the outcome. You make time for a conversation when you don't have time to spare. You speak for justice and dignity when you see people suffering. You ask the name of the person who's cleaning the halls for you. And you listen to her critique of the times when you have passed by others without even so much of, as an introduction. When she looks you in the eye and says, it's good to be seen and not observed. Practicing these fundamentals, it's not going to leave us as rich or as full or as merry or as renowned as we might have been. But they condition us for the long season ahead because our life here is just spring training. This is less the time to be swinging for the fences, Jesus says, and more the time to focus on getting the fundamentals right. Right.